got here the air at Paris, um, uh, a Duchamp ready made, and I want you to have this in your head. You will hear it in the talk. Now you see it, now you see it, now you don't. All right, you ready for it to go bye-bye? Bye-bye! Bye-bye, Duchamp. All right, so much for you. Okay. So I want to talk today about the ephrastic impulse and revision and how they can feed off each other. Everyone can hear me okay, right? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So first, the ephrastic impulse. What is it? My Dictionary of Literary Terms says it is a vivid description of a work of art. And although we think first of ephrasis and relationship to visual art, like think of Homer and the Iliad, the Shield of Achilles, think of Keats, the Ode on the Grecian Urn. These are the ones we're all familiar with. I'm very fond of using music as the jumping off point for pushing a graph beyond its early versions, as I did in an essay about textile mills from my new book, The World is on Fire. So, so much for visual art, because where we really are is with Robert Plant and those tight jeans. Okay, so now we will proceed to get the lead out. Oh, and if you would, go ahead and get out a notebook, because we're going to do a little bit of drafty drafty at the very end. Go ahead and get that out if you are feeling the need to write some words with some stylus or pencil. That's right. That's right. If you want to scribe a little bit, it will be fun. It will be technologically enhanced. It's going to be great. Okay, you ready? You ready now? All right. So. As we all know, the wonderful song, When the Levee Breaks, 1971 by Led Zeppelin. Keeps on raining, levee's gonna break. When the levee breaks, I'll have no place to stay. Crime won't help you, praying won't do you no good. When the levee breaks, mama, you gotta move. In 1981, when I moved with my family to upstate South Carolina, people still called the area the textile capital of the world. The mills there manufactured towels, sheets, and apparel. They made florist webbing, fiberglass cloth, and material for spacesuits. By the time I finished high school, 13 years later, the region's economy had undergone a radical shift, and almost all the textile mills were shuttered. Not long ago, after many years away, I moved back to the mountainous foothills of South Carolina, and the story of the textile mills' rise and collapse haunted me. When I tried to write an essay about it, the research followed my usual <coughs> patterns. First, exploration of physical space, in this case, walking around long closed mills in my hometown. Next, exhaustive research, which for this project meant multiple sessions in the Greenville County Library's archive, paging through cultural histories and old manufacturing directories. But as much as I drafted, the essay remained lifeless. The poke it, nothing happened. It was dead, you guys. I worked and worked on it, it was dead. Then one day, as I was driving around town, Led Zeppelin's When the Levee Breaks came on the radio. Can I get a witness? That summer had been unusually rainy. At one point, Greenville's rainfall totals were higher than those of Seattle. Creeks flooded, bridges washed out, mountainsides buckled. The strange weather unnerved people, and we started joking about rain lasting 40 days and 40 nights. Animals boarding two by two. It hit me then that the essay I'd been going over might be about something more than just the mills. In part, it might be about rebuilding after a crisis, one that people outside the region had forgotten, if they ever noticed it at all. So I started revising the essay with When the Levee Breaks in mind, drawing out images of water and rain, and searching for additional research material to fill in the gaps of what I knew. The song became my tuning fork. When I struck it, other elements of the essay began to resonate at its frequency. Joey, tell us, how did you do that? How did you work this, Joey? Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> Gathering material. I drew the essay's material from a range of sources. A pamphlet published by Smokestack Building Corporation in 1924. <coughs> the book Modern Brickmaking, written by Arthur B. Searle and published by, in, by London Scott Greenwood's son in 1911. Oral and Cultural Histories of the Industry in the Area, Field Guides to Local Trees, Manufacturing Directors in the 1960s and 1970s, Interviews with Former Textile Mill Workers, and My Own Visits to Abandoned Mills, some legal, some not, you guys. That's right. <laughs> Putting, when the, yeah, that's right. 
you got to jump that fence. Putting when the levee breaks on heavy rotation led me to the musicology of the Zeppelin version, as well as Memphis Minnie's original 1929 recording. This led me to a biography of Memphis Minnie, the history of the blues, and material about the Great Mississippi Flood of 1927, which was the inspiration for the song. Reading about the Great Flood caused me to further consider the Flood of Genesis, which then led to meditations on the archetypal stories underlying our shared lives, creation, destruction, and loss. I found evidence of these ancient stories in upstate South Carolina and worked to bring out those resonances using the particular things I found in the archives and on my field trips. Things like nails, thread, cloth, bricks, and clay, along with images of my home state's landscape. Here I think it's useful to include the essay's first section. Tell me a story you know by heart. All anybody could talk about that summer was the rain. Tomatoes split, whole beans molded, muskmelons turned to rot. Roadbeds gullied and joggy lot washed out. Boughs exploded off oak trees. Mountainsides slid down a slope in a crush of mud. The sign of the Baptist church said, whoever's praying for rain, Please stop. <laughs> and the song I couldn't shake was When the Levee Breaks. Memphis Minnie Douglas and her husband, Kansas Joe, wrote it about the devastating 1927 flood that killed nearly 300 people and wiped out tens of thousands of acres in the Mississippi Delta. Refugees from inundated towns waved in tent cities above another, bigger levee while they figured out their next move. Thousands of them left the Delta forever, setting off for cities like Chicago and what became known as the Great Migration. The version of the song that most people know is Led Zeppelin's, and the classic rock stations around here play it plenty. John Bonham's drum line, fleshy, thumpy, heavy as a millstone, sounds like dread made physical, and yet somehow it's tempting. It catches your ear and you sigh over, lean against it. Down on the river's edge, weeds grow in clay. Surely there's no harm in letting your toes play in the water, in the body current, thick with silt. Tell me a story you know by heart. In that opening line, I try to convey intimacy with the reader, to conjure up images of storyteller and listener trading stories beside a flickering fire. I wanted this first line to act as a summons. By addressing the listener, I call that listener into being. I love direct address. If it's good enough for Walt Whitman, it's good enough for me. Now it is you, compact, visible, realizing my poem, seeking me, fancying how happy you were if I could be with you and become your comrade. Be it as if I were with you. Be not too certain, but I am now with you. And the phrase by heart is intended to show that the story I'm about to tell is one that's dear to me. I've turned it over in my hands like a stone worried it like the hem of a skirt. The next paragraph enacts place via particulars. Notice they're not green beans, they're whole beans. Not cantaloupes, but muskmelons. Not flea market, but jockey lot. These names convey the accent of the place. And like the textile industry, this language is something we're in danger of losing. So I listened closely and included local speech patterns wherever I could, as in the whoever is praying for rain church song a way to signal both humor and belief. Later in the essay, I include dialogue taken from oral histories, interviews with former textile workers, and overheard conversations. Fragments valuable not only for the break they provide from my own voice, a break that many creative nonfiction writers and teachers will tell you is essential, but also for the record they provide of the men and women I spoke with during my research, those who actually did this work. I felt that was very important. Essays also need to avoid being static, a particular risk when image rather than narrative is the driving force of the piece. Variety, or dynamic, which can be accomplished using heightened language, shifts in location, juxtaposition of styles, even in the kinds of research material included, works to keep things interesting for the reader. If in music the word dynamic can refer to shifts in volume, tone, and style, in the opening section's third paragraph, dynamic is created in a shift from individual, particular, like the song I Couldn't Shake, Memphis Mini, Kansas Joe, individuals, to a larger context, hundreds killed, thousands displaced. 
In the third paragraph, John Bonham's drum riff is dynamic too. It manages to convey both dread and allure. The reader hears the heavy, ominous beat and sees herself dipping her toes in the water nonetheless. So dangerous, guys. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have gathering material, and now we have refrain. I know you want that, refrain. In essays, as in songs, a refrain can help weave the narrative together. In my own essay, I write about taking repeated trips to a variety of local textile mills, some abandoned, some in the process of renovation. One of them is being demolished. The recurring images are what I return to and what a reader, in turn, is anchored by. Lists compose another form of refrain, meant to evoke both the musicality and the warts and all approach that Whitman took in Leaves of Grass, particularly Song to Myself. As you can see, like, I think the greatest part about revising an essay is just obsessing about some particular other song or other poem or other piece of art and trying to enact that in your own writing. It gives you a reason to, to listen to these things and read them closely, and that can be no hardship when you love them so much. From about midpoint of my essay, you'll hear, I hope, some Whitman would like repetition here. I see a boy weep as he wraps his dead dog in a terry cloth towel. I see a daughter fold a washcloth with ice and apply it to a mother's forehead to break a fever. I see a woman unroll a stocking over one foot, then the other, and secure them at the top of stays. I see knitted socks fall to the floor beside a bed. Here, I try to draw attention to the relational quality of textiles, daily, intimate goods that furnish our waking and sleeping moments, and which we often overlook. One thing I wanted to avoid was nostalgia, a rosy look back at work that was always physical and often dangerous, work that took a real toll on the people in the landscape. Another section begins, Say the Names. I strove to emulate Whitman in that, too, through its direct address to the reader, as well as in the list that follows. Particulars I found in the directories of local manufacturers, including the names of the mills and the products made and number of employees who worked in each. All those jobs are gone. In the third section, I incorporated information gleaned from the history of southern textile mills and retold it in a Whitman-like style. I also used specific words as refrains in the essay, including the reiteration of key elements such as water, clay, and wood, as well as echoes of previous mentions of particulars like nicknames. All right, so gathering material and refrain, we move on to myth-making, everybody's favorite, myth-making. But Joni, can you myth make in um, an essay and, and not make things up? I believe you can. I'm going to tell you how. <laughs> All right. So glad you asked. All right, myth making. As I worked toward the essay's final draft, I wanted to sound a mythic note, not by falsifying information, but by drawing attention to my subject's larger significance. I believe that by drawing the reader's attention to the specifics of place or experience, a writer can remind the reader of the delight and surprise to be had even from the objects and words that we could otherwise take for granted. Um, I was thinking about this last night as Kathy read her wonderful poems. I was newly aware of letters at the beginning of lines. It defamiliarized letters for me. That was so exciting. Because I mean, who thinks about letters? I had this since I was, you know, a wee thing learning about letters. It was wonderful. It's a wonderful gift. Yeah. All right. We would otherwise take for granted. For example, from early in the essay. In the fall, sumac blazes red and orange. You can use its wood to make picture frames, napkin rings, or darners. Or you can boil its leaves to make black ink, with which you can write all this down to help you remember. Here, the move toward the mythic happens when the narrator invests a quotidian act, writing, with a larger significance, to help you remember. The act of remembering is itself a repeated chord, another refrain throughout the essay. If Marcel Duchamp can bottle and label the air of Paris, and by so doing create art, so too a writer can reframe stories that we all know, and by recasting them into the local key, a specific town or region of people, help us reappraise our own place and time. By drawing attention to the relics of the place, forgotten garland from Mill's last Christmas party, bricks painted sanitary green, iron stained planks of heart pine, a reader may come to understand some of the hidden and otherwise forgotten work that went on in that environment. 
Describing the objects and unpacking some of their importance helps the reader slow down and see the heavy hardwood shovel, tipped with steel at its points, polished from thousands of passes through the room. All right, last thing. When the levee breaks, we got to come back to that. When the levee breaks. Why does the song animate the essay? Maybe because although the essay contains narratives both large and small, the rise and fall of the textile industry in the southeast, my visits to abandoned textile mills in my hometown, that narrative was never the essay's reason for being. That was a huge realization that it was not primarily about that narrative. These textile mills haunted me for years. They still do, every time I drive past a tagged up ruin. And that haunted note thrums throughout the essay, which I eventually titled Warp and Weft, and which was included in my collection The World is on Fire. Scrap, Treasure, and Songs of Apocalypse, recently published by Milkweed Editions. My obsession with the mills and my homeland's past haunts the rest of the collection, too. Not in a sinister sense, but in the sense of becoming aware of the many histories of the place. Seen this way, to live with an awareness of the haunted quality of the place is to experience your hours there more deeply. What replaces the clatter of the silence gloom? Freight trains, insistent wrens, Overhearing a man say, I feel so good, I'd give $20 for a headache. <laughs> and even though the great flood of 27 triggered the writing of When the Levee Breaks, I'd argue the song's real subject is that of obliteration's seductive pull. The music glorifies the experience of losing oneself in longing, in grief, in song. Listening, you hum and long and mourn along with the singer, but you don't physically leave for Chicago or anywhere else. This is a song not about a story, but about the quality of an experience. In the same way, for me, the point of my essay lies in drawing attention to an overlooked corner of the world, thereby allowing the reader to enter into the strangeness and particulars of this place and showing why this loss matters. By examining the drape and salvage of this material, the hours that women and men gave to this labor may yet live. So, that was the craft talk part. Now, for the exercise part, are you ready to jam with me? You seem ready. I'm so ready. You know it's Thursday. All right. Thank you. Okay, we got your notebook out. Think now of a well, you can do this a couple of ways. You can do it whichever way is most useful for you. You can generate something new. We'll do this in a couple of steps. And or you can think back to a piece you're already working on. Since my talk is primarily about revision, I'm in the revision headspace. But you use this in whatever way is most useful for you. And we'll still finish a bit early. We're talking about Q&A, so that's awesome. All right, so think of a piece that you are currently working on or you can start something new whether it's a poem, an essay, or a story. Let's take a little time to think about it in terms of music. First, in terms of an actual song or songs, and then in terms of musical terms and song shape, okay? All right, so here's the first thing. As you think back over the piece you're working on, or if you want to start something new, what soundtrack comes to mind? Think about research leads that you may have left for yourself without realizing like a mention of a song or a lyric. I'm thinking about those. Write down any that may come to mind. Or, it's fun to think about music. American Top 40. Casey Kasem, he's here with us. Okay. Gone but not forgotten, Casey. Gone but not forgotten. <laughs> We're on some dress. He has to take it on now. He has to take the mantle on. Or, <laughs> think back to the period you're writing about in this piece. What song seemed always to be on the radio when you walked past the bodega, a road in the minivan with your neighbor to school, when the dad next door is washing a car on the weekend? Start by writing down all the lyrics you can remember, any song that bubbles back up to mind. You don't have to know where it's going, it's okay. And don't worry if you can't remember all the lyrics. If there are gaps, that is fine. You can find that out later. Start by writing down those lyrics and then grab onto them. Let them carry you back into this moment in your life. And I'll give you a minute or so for that. Go.
just keep going. As you write, open your mind to the sensory details that accompany those lyrics. What details do they drag up to the surface with them? Songs are powerful that way. Think about sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch, as well as emotional memory. Write down how that song made you feel. How do you feel when you hear this song now? now of ways in which you might implement song shape into your essay in a larger structural way. So we'll do this step by step. First, refrain. What might recur in your piece? What keeps coming back to you as you think about this period in your life of this song? For me, one of my refrains was that series of visits to the extinct textile mills. For you, it might be a repeated image, or a series of Sundays, or some question you can't let go of. What could you draw more attention to? What can't you let go of? This might become a refrain in a later revision of this material. Take just a minute or so. Let us move on to dynamic. How can you implement more variety into peace? How could you get other voices on the page? How could you find additional sources of information? How could you shift from particular individual to a larger context? Take just a minute to brainstorm some places you might start looking for larger context or other voices. Just brainstorm a little bit about the idea of dynamic a step further. How could you shift between one voice, probably your narrators, to the combined voices of a chorus, maybe members of a friend group or a family group? So think about shifting between one voice, probably a version of your own, 
to the combined voices of the chorus, many members of the friend group of our family. Can you give us an example of that? Mm -hmm. So in, in my piece, I shifted between my narrator and then um, like when I went to the archive and, and I found lists of all the, the different jobs people had had and I tried to pull those together into a collective that was part of it. So it was not only my experience of me talking with like one or two individual former mill workers, but looking at here were 1,200 jobs, they're gone. Here are 800 jobs, they were gone. Here were 732 jobs.
no resting place with that. Okay, how did that go? Something different? Hard to know yet. You guys know Mark Doty's wonderful poetry and essays. And he's read here from years past, and he was my mentor at Houston, and I was really fortunate about that. And I heard him give a talk about a year ago, and he said, try to try and get past whatever your usual habits of writing are. If you usually go to a quiet library, try mixing it up, go to a coffee shop, go to a train station, go someplace where it's loud and noisy, and try to get some of that energy from what you're doing. If you usually write really long lines, try writing short. Um, whatever your usual defaults are, try mixing those up a little bit and see see what happens. Um, which is partly why I wanted to bring in something that was not Led Zeppelin, but um, instead Gillian Welch, to get outside the, the usual thing, but also maybe bring something that you weren't necessarily familiar with to kind of enter into a different mind space with a song that's maybe less familiar. All right. Well, we have a little time for Q&A, and then check and see if the coffee's here. What do you think? It is. Do people have any questions about anything? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Could you just repeat the name of the artist of the song? Absolutely. So Gillian Welch is is the, 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 the singer. Gillian, G-I-L-L-I-A-N. Welch, like the grape juice. You have the E-L-C-H. And this is, the album is The Hero and the Harvest. That was Scarlet Town, the first song on it. I love all her stuff. I just love it. I love Time the Revelator. That's a really great album. But that song is called what? That song is Scarlet Town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry about the. There must have been some dust on the CD. I'm sorry about that. Who lives in a falling world? What questions do people have about anything? Mm -hmm. I just thought that was intentional, and then there was something different in that space in between. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Maybe kind of a happy accident. Maybe it's like becoming newly aware of letters, you know, like just drawing attention to quiet space again. Mm -hmm. And it's framed, which is really what research is all about framing and contextualizing. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Mm -hmm. satellite dish, you know, it just takes in all kinds of stuff. And this is really good on a research trip, but then just in regular life too. Like if I go on a research trip somewhere, let's say at the American Museum of Natural History, there's all kinds of things that I could choose to notice there. You know, the little signs that tell you about the habitat display, all that's good stuff. You can get um, the little brochures and pamphlets and things in the gift shop. I love to spend money in the gift shop. That's all good, and that's kind of a straight story. But then as you overhear and eavesdrop, like John Robert was saying, it's a very useful thing to do, and I love to do it too. People will say the craziest things. Like you're writing all that stuff down too. And I have on a t shirt that'll say something bizarre. You write that down. Or um, like a bumper sticker on the car. You just you never know what little gem the world will, will drop in your way. Like, I feel so good, I give twenty dollars for a headache. Thank you, sir. Thank you, <laughs> you know, sir. You said that, you know? Yeah. But but I think for me it has to do with trying to be aware and trying to cultivate a habit of noticing and then being having the luxury to take a lot of time to revise until it feels like the right thing and not forced. And also driving around my car listening to a Rock 101, WROQ, the upstate's home of classic rock. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I recommend that to anybody. Yeah, that's where writing comes from, it's classic rock. <laughs> I feel like the hard part is uh, maintaining an openness to serendipity because I mean, I, I just want to get shit done. Right. And that's 
like not conducive to you got to live with a piece of work long enough so that the serendipitous things happen right. and you can apprehend them and fold them into the work right. um, and that the idea that you have to just walk around doing nothing much instead of like forcing your novel or story or essay into shape uh, is very vexing well that's right but but there, there are there are always multiple threads of it that are going at any one time. So, I, I before I, I found the Led Zeppelin song, what what could I control? I could go to the archive. I could look up modern brick making, which was fabulous. I love to learn more about bricks. Many of the textiles are made of bricks. I learned something about that. That was delightful. Um, I I went to these different mills. I saw the beautiful smokestacks that were built by a traveling smokestack team from New York. They went all over the country making these smokestacks, many of which are still at stand today. The ones in my town are between 200 and 250 feet, but they also built, you'll be glad to know, the world's tallest freestanding masonry smokestack, um, which is out in, in Montana for it, and, um, an extinct copper mine. It's over 500 feet tall. I mean, think about it. This was in, you know, it's like 120 years ago, and those guys are just up there without our modern safety equipment, just being ballers and making these amazing smokestacks. So I could research that. Like there, were, in a way, there's like the conscious brain that can use. Um, the conscious brain can go and look for research material and interview people, and that part can work. And then the subconscious brain can listen and overhear and take in the serendipity, maybe. For me, that's that's how that's how this essay came together. For but it is a great thing to have the luxury to not have to rush through it, too. Tenure, tenure, tenure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, okay. I will keep you from coughing. Thanks so much for your kind attention.